going on, everybody? It is the Misfit Bear, and welcome to an indie game called Tiny Bunny. That is a tiny bunny, and that is not a bunny that I would ever want to associate with. Hell, I didn't even want to associate with Benincula way back in the day, the vampire bunny. I'm sure the real ones will remember Benincula, but this is supposed to be a uh, visual novel, indie game, spoopin' game, kind of reminds me of uh, when I played Shiver, so uh, I'm expecting jump scares. If the music is any indication, this game is going to have one hell of a mood to it. So, my light may be on, but why don't you turn yours down? Why don't you pop in some headphones, some earbuds, and let's go on this adventure together. I'm going to have to get my reading voice in, so let's go ahead and uh, hit new game, and let's get right to it. wind clawed at my window all night long. It wandered the fields and howled like a hungry beast. An endless song weaved from all sorts of voices, shrill, gentle, sneery, twined in the air. They were shouting and laughing and arguing about something. Someone was running through the snow while casting long shadows that would occasionally creep close to my bed. Our house had a mind of its own, the creaky old mind of a building that had seen a lot in its days and was seemingly trying to share its wisdom with the inhabitants. The lonely house faced the forest, and the dark green thicket gazed back with its hollow eyes, rustling, whizzing, swaying back and forth. One could come out and stand at the edge of the forest to reassure themselves there was nobody behind the crooked trees. Fuzzy silhouettes swaying in the wind couldn't possibly do any harm. It's just a play of light and shadow. Just a play. I knew it was just my imagination. I was already twelve after all. Still. Oh, whoa, I barely noticed that. It was like a fox or something on the window. Hey, put away your book. How many times have I told you not to read at the table? It's bad for your health. Look at how slouched you are. Hide. Oh, this is so nice. It looks really nice. The art is amazing. I didn't protest and put the book about Conan the Barbarian aside. I was stuck on a line I couldn't understand after reading it three times anyway. Olia had already finished her breakfast and was munching on some cookies. She was so enthusiastic, she almost looked like your typical girl from commercials. You're not going anywhere until you finish all of it. I, on the other hand, was still trying to drill a hole in the plate with my eyes, as if it would make the porridge disappear. Hazy anxiousness welled up inside, all because of the previous sleepless night the black forest around our house in the gloomy wind. The longer I waited, the colder the lumpy white substance became. It looked like a jellyfish from the Cousteau Odyssey. I love that show. I wonder how horrifying the bottom of the ocean is, or how cold the black forest is at night. The spoon fell out of my hand. Mom showered me with a cold glare from her green eyes. What did I just say? I'll get it. I had 10 seconds to catch my breath before battling the nasty porridge once again. I felt around for the spoon. What is this? Carved on the other side of the table. Karina. Ha, that's my mom's name. I guess she carved it out with something pointy when she was little. She sure was a rascal, damaging the furniture like that. She would scold me for a week if I did something similar, though. Should I remind her about it? Nah, she's been in a bit of a bad mood lately. I imagined her being my age, sitting under this table. I wonder, was mom afraid of the dark back then? Or the sounds coming from the attic? Or the thick forest? 
I imagine my grandma coming into my little mom's room, sitting at the edge of her bed, where Olia sleeps nowadays, and saying this in her soft, smooth voice. Taiga is a special place, little girl. It's watching you closely, sniffing you out, trying to discern what kind of beast you are. If you're a good sort, it won't abandon you in times of trouble. But if you are a bad apple, it'll grab you by the side and drag you under the ground. And that would be it. Grandma was caring. She never fought with anybody. Never yelled, yelled, never swore. Those were the times without the maddening screams until late at night, without smashed dishes and mutual accusations. Our parents used to love each other back then. I remember listening in on one of their conversations by chance. They were talking about Grandma getting prepared for her funeral. She had already bought a casket, and she called it her cute funeral box. It waited for its time in the closet, patiently. It was black, upholstered with meat-colored material on the inside. I saw it when my grandma was getting buried. The house didn't change since the time she was alive. Only all of the photos were gone. Glass-covered pictures with gray faces of my ancestors. They all had a dead but watchful look in their eyes. I crawled out from under the table. Olia was done with her cookies and was looking at my share like a sly woodland critter. I turned my gaze toward the frosted window. There were a lot of dark pines outside, but they didn't grab my attention. The pattern of frost formed a picture on the glass. Olia, look, it's a fox. Where? It looked almost like those optical illusion thingies they put on the back of student notebooks. A mixture of lines at first glance, but if you blur your vision a little bit and look under a certain angle, not outside, on the window. Look, here's the nose, and here's, hey, eat up. Yes, yes, just a moment. I don't see anything. Hurry up, there's not much left. Ah, uh, there it is. But it still doesn't look like one, and I'm telling you it does. Nuh-uh. It does. Stop it. These kids, I swear. Every parent ever, including myself. Now I couldn't see the fox either. It disappeared went away. Only the frosty patterns similar to stretched out nettle leaves kept creeping up the glass. My dad entered the kitchen with long, measured steps. I want to have a beard like his when I grow up. I mean, you know. <laughs> Mom would always ask, jokingly, come on, shave it off, it stings. This was so long ago. Nowadays, rumbling doors and witty comebacks were an everyday occurrence. Olia always covers her ears when she hears something like, what's the point in all this, through the wall. It's all for your sake, Dad would reply, for the sake of our family. I always caught every sound in fear of hearing the most dreaded, the deadliest word that started with a D. D-I-V-O. I don't even want to finish it. It was scary to imagine that me and my little sister could be torn apart and taken into two different families. Anyway, your fox is nothing. I have an owl on my window. You and your owl talk again? You said you believed me just yesterday. Has anybody seen my car keys? I remember leaving them on the windowsill. Right. Maybe you did, and maybe not. You're a grown man and a father of two, and still. Karina, please stop. Just let me get ready in peace. Your keys are in the basket near the phone. Well, thank you very much. Anton, stop making a martyr out of yourself and finish eating already. And the owl? There was no owl. But there was one. It had giant glowing eyes. Olia sprung up from the chair and placed her hands on her little face, imitating a pair of eyes with her fingers, the size of an apple each. Last year, you had Babai in your closet. And now this owl? Babai? What is Babai? Okay, I can't click it apparently. But it underlined it, so I'm going to have to remember that. But, but I saw it. Olia shifted her gaze back and forth from dad to mom to me, but couldn't find any support. Have you thought about befriending it? You know, like feeding it with imaginary mice? Don't bully our girl. She's just afraid to sleep alone because she's still little. Olia pouted her lips in rebellion and rushed into the hallway. The staircase that led to the second floor creaked. Mom gave dad a strict look. Oh, that look in her eyes. It's so uncomfortable to be pinned under it. Dad just snorted in reply and left, ringing with the keys he just found. 
A minute had passed, and the theme song from The Little Mermaid echoed through the house. It was stored on incredibly worn-out cassette tapes, which Dad already had to glue together once. It's so easy to fix objects, by gluing them back together, for example. But how do you fix a relationship? Mom moved into the living room, and I was left alone, anxiously stealing glances at the window. Olia had trouble sleeping ever since we moved to this house. She would toss and turn or curl up into a ball under her blanket. Sometimes she would jump up in the middle of the night and turn on the VCR. Cartoons helped to take her mind off of all the troubles we had with the move and our parents. Whoa! And then Olia said she saw that giant flying monster outside her window. She became obsessed with it. Our parents did everything in their power. They tried every little trick to get rid of those ridiculous fears. Olia refused to sleep alone and didn't believe that the owl was just one of her nightmares. After tonight, I was unsure what to make of my sister's words, what to think of it myself. Can nightmares be infectious? Just last night, I couldn't get a wink of sleep and ended up thinking of what to expect in my new school. There were a couple of days left before the beginning of the new term. My imagination drew long, twisted hallways that led to a classroom full of kids, but all the students behind their desks were simply dark figures cut out using a template. Circular holes gaped in the middle of their faces. A pairs of eyes blinked inside those holes. It was as if some completely different creature was looking at me from behind the flat black silhouettes. Their cruel glares, filled with icy sneers, made me shiver from head to toe. Will I survive here? Won't they gang up on me and beat me down? Stomp on me with their bloodied shoes? The damn school can burn for all I care. I just wished for anything to happen to it. Doesn't really matter what. I didn't want to go there that badly. I didn't want to see people who are just itching to smack me on the head, trip me up, think of a new offensive name for me, worse than the previous one. I felt like the glasses I wore made me an outsider or some sort of monster. My gaze slid across the drawings hanging on the walls. I couldn't consider myself a great artist, but Olia begged me to hang them. Drawing was the only thing that made me happy as of late. The small circles of friends I had also enjoyed my paintings, and they promised to call me from time to time. Sometimes I imagined Mom picking up the phone and saying in a cold voice, You've got the wrong number. Or, Anton is not around. Anton is not around. I imagine my future classmates lying in their beds just like me, listening to the howls of invisible werewolves outside their windows. Maybe my new classmates will like me after all, but who would ever like a boy with thick glasses? That's real shit, because I was bullied too and I've always had thick glasses. I mean, my dad used to wear glasses when he was little and now he's married to the most beautiful woman on the planet, my mom. The house creaked. Pressed by the wind, the condo we used to live in, a nine-floor concrete building, buzzed with the neighbor's drill, mumbled with a TV set from behind the wall, cried like a baby from the big family next door. Our current house, though I can't really call it new, was completely different. It was silent and easygoing during the day. Its shadows lay dormant in the corners, on the closet cobwebs, and under the stairs. But they all woke up during the night. Something was watching me from every corner, almost as if the old photos of my deceased family with their ashen eyes were hanging on the walls in place of my drawings. The floor was squeaking, rusty drains were moaning, the attic was occupied by noisy drafts. One could think the house was performing some sort of demonic melody, and then I realized I was, in fact, hearing music. It was already playing for a good while. Somewhere at the edge of my perception, I could hear a flute. It was mixed in with the sound of the wind, of the creaking old house, and my thoughts. I stood up and rushed to the window. I wanted to reassure myself that this music was nothing more than a product of my imagination. It's not like someone is playing it there amidst the cold, snowy night, right? Whoa! Someone was dancing in the field. 
black silhouettes I could barely make out with the dark forest as their backdrop. They jumped around, basked in moonlight, bumped into piles of snow, rolled around and crawled on all fours. Stories about wolves playing under the moon came to mind, but these were clearly not wolves. They stood upright at times, circled around holding hands and whipping up snow, disappearing into the shadows for a brief moment and then coming back. Something bizarre was going on. Shadows dancing in the starless abyss made my imagination go wild, making me anxious at the same time. That's not good. Suddenly, the music had stopped. The dancing shadows froze in place, and I could swear, pierced me with their eyes. One of the silhouettes immediately parted from the bizarre shadow carnival and sprinted across the field with giant leaps. Oh boy. Oh boy. It glided on squeaky snow without leaving any prints until it was devoured by the pitch black shadow of my house, which became even darker and thicker. My heart was jumping around like the bird inside a cage. I shut the curtains with a swift motion and stepped back toward the bed. They saw me. A freezing torrent of fear washed over me. I stood in the middle of a perfectly dark room and listened to some unwanted guest move and scrape around looking for an entrance. The sound moved to the right, then circled around the house. Now my guest should be at the front door. I jumped into the bed and covered myself with the blanket as if it could protect me. The shackles of fear locked my muscles. I remembered the funeral, my grandma lying there, hands crossed on her chest, her facial features sharp like that of a tin doll. Ants running up and down the legs of chairs that held my grandma's casket. I imagined those little creatures climbing up her head and pulling up her eyelids with their tiny legs. Then her wrinkly eyeballs would once again move inside their sockets and she'd be able to see her grandchildren. I was chanting the spell she taught me throughout the whole procedure and now lying under the blanket and listening to squeaks and howls, I was repeating the same words. On the island of Buyan, underneath the blemished sun, in the sea of color blue stands a cabin made of wood. There lay lard and ashen hair for the spawn from devil's lair to feast and always leave alone God's faithful servant named Anton. Evil leave this house must, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Bizarre sounds had disappeared. I cautiously peeked out from under the blanket and saw curtains waving around like a hangman. And then the night doused me with a new portion of boiling terror. The sound scratched at my eardrums. In reality, something or someone was scratching at the front door, hurriedly clawing at wood, demanding to be let in. The door was shut. Dad had become very cautious recently, so he installed a sturdy lock. I remember him staring at the forest intently, as if he was looking for someone. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I hugged my knees, placing my chin between them, and drilled the door with my eyes. It was so flimsy and weak before the might of darkness. And then... The doorknob twitched slightly. Then it turned halfway, once, twice, as if the person who tried to enter had no hands. The doorknob tilted once more, and then started clicking violently. My jaw cramped from fear. My wet fingers clutched the blanket. The door creaked and opened. The wind taunted me, moaning inside the ten drains. Now, now you see. The door was wide open. The darkness writhed inside the carnivorous mouth of the doorway. My sister's pale face protruded from the thick shadows. I almost screamed from relief. Olia, I'm not sleeping. Did something happen? Olia frowned and stuck out her lower lip, a clear sign that she was about to cry. It's there again, staring at me. Shoo her away, Tony, please. I'm so scared. 
The fear that was tormenting me just a minute ago crawled away and hid somewhere in my stomach. I needed to calm Olya down. It was a dream, silly. Don't be scared. Dreams don't bite. No one is going to harm you. Olya sobbed. She was trying her best to believe me. But was I sure myself? I have an idea. Let's go to your room and watch the video Sleeping Beauty, for example. You like that cartoon, don't you? Why does the Sleeping Beauty have a prince, and I have this scary bird? That question took me by surprise. All right, let's watch Cinderella. My thoughts became tangled, fuzzy. What was that? What studied me with its eyes while dancing feverishly under the moon? The darkness was clinging to the window, and it couldn't be fooled by Grandma's old chants. It couldn't be satisfied with a feast of lard and long ashen hair. Tony, you coming? Yes, yes, just a moment. <laughs> Oh my freaking heart. <gasps> my freaking heart. Oh my god. <sighs> That's why I didn't want to laugh at Olya and her owl in the morning. Who would be visiting us here in the middle of nowhere? We don't know anyone around here. So persistent. I felt extremely unsettled just from a silly thought that our morning guest could have come from the woods. I could barely hear voices coming from the front door. My mind was urging me to hide. In the closet, under the table, behind the curtains where Olia always hides. Tony, come here. I felt like kettlebells were tied to my feet, but still dragged them toward the hallway. A couple of policemen towered over me in the doorway. They smelled like frost and worry. My mom always winced and grumbled the moment she saw patrol cars, worse than bandits. At the moment, though, she looked somewhat confused. Hello? The senior officer who wore a grim expression nodded. A boy had gone missing yesterday. His name's Vova. Look at this, please. Have you seen him? The policeman held out a photograph to me. Oh, the art is so beautiful. Oh, and he's got a little kitty. There was a ginger boy around the age of elementary school, pictured with a wall carpet as the backdrop. He had a striped cat in his hands and wore a wide smile. No, I haven't. Are you sure? Look closely. Where would I see him? I don't know anyone around here. I barely leave the house. Well, maybe you've seen him from the window? That's right, your windows look straight to the forest, don't they? The window. No, I haven't seen anything. I see. He sounded tired, but his eyes, his stare, long and heavy, was full of suspicion. I squirmed unwittingly under the weight of guilt, which his giant shadow cast over me. The policeman finally tore his eyes from me and glanced over the hallway, the stairway, and the cracks in the ceiling, which I haven't noticed before for some reason. How do you like the new place, by the way? Getting used to it? Bit by bit, it's just our little daughter misses the city a lot. Misses the city, huh? Have the locals been treating you well? Yes, everything is alright, thank you. The policeman pierced through me once more. With his gray eyes, my head started spinning. Um, can, can I help you somehow? I asked that in a shaky voice to look like a polite boy and to end this unpleasant conversation sooner. Now that I think about it, you look just like one of my nephews, little fella. He's a witty boy around your age, wears the same type of goggles, <laughs> always engrossed in reading those mystery novels. Told me he wants to enroll in police school when his family visited this summer. Wanted to help other people just like me, see? I felt uncomfortable, as if a distant relative and not a police officer stood before me. You know what? Little boys like you should stay at home, steer away from trouble. Times have changed so much. Mom interjected in a cold voice. You don't say. Ah, well then, 
What grade are you in, Tony boy? Sixth. Have you made any friends here so far? Not yet. I'll be going to school for the first time after the break. Ah, uh, then I'll leave you my number just in case. Call me if you have any new info. The policemen were gone along with their shadows, the smell of cheap cologne, and the photo of a smiling boy. His face still stood before my eyes. I wondered what it was like for him, being all alone. There. For some reason, I thought of the forest, swaying in the wind. What did his poor parents feel? And what would my parents do if I'd gone missing? Would they cry and thrash around hysterically? Or would they accuse each other like they always do and forget about me eventually? Mom, this Vova, did he go missing in our forest? Seems like it, poor child. I looked out the window at the road. The police, UAZ, drove off toward the village. The officer's nephew came to mind when I was splitting off old paint from the windowsill. I remembered all the teenage mystery novels from the Black Kitty series I've read this summer. Your average boys and girls investigated all sorts of mysteries there. They looked for clues, spied on suspicious people, and after a set of amazing adventures, bam, solved any complicated case. They became local celebrities and must have made their parents very proud. I noticed a trail of policemen's footprints that led to the forest, and then it clicked in my head. Why don't I start an investigation of my own? Maybe I'll find that lost boy, and I'll get a reward. Olia will be so happy. And not only Olia, mom and dad too. Maybe they'll even forget about their quarrels for a while. Maybe I'll even save us from the D word. I fantasized about buying Olia a Tamagotchi and getting a cassette player and a bunch of tapes for myself. You already know this is the 90s, man. And a whole box of Kinder Surprise. When was the last time our parents bought us any toys? Last autumn, I think. My dad had lost his job at the time. There's that annoying song about it. I had little to no idea what was the accountant's job like. They count money, I think. Neighbors used to envy us. But nowadays, mom and dad barely had money to afford sweets, and dad would always divide a single chocolate bar between me and Olia. Sometimes I gave her my share too. No matter how much I wanted to eat sweets, she was still just a pipsqueak. I couldn't wait to go out, looking for clues. I'm going outside. Yeah, right. You want the police to go around with your photograph next? The forest is so thick. What if the boy got snatched up by wild animals? Or something even worse? Even worse, echoed through the hallway. I won't go far. I'll stay away from the forest. Did you hear what I said, or should I repeat myself? Better go pack your school bag or play with Olia. The sound of splashing water came from the kitchen. It meant that the argument was over and mom had the last word. Ooh, so now we have choices now. Uh, I guess let's go back to the kitchen. Uh, can I open the fridge? Ooh, I've been there. That struggle is real, man. Can I talk to mom? It was difficult to lie to mom, but there was no other way for me to run away from home. Mom, something's wrong with the TV. The picture is dim and there are stripes all over the screen. Mom's face became visibly distorted. Ah, uh, you're killing me here. So have you had enough of shooting those stupid ducks now? Wait, hold on. Are you talking about duck hunt? <laughs> Told you the kinescope will go dim because of your console. Yeah, I think he's talking about Duck Hunt. Mario Duck Hunt. Where will we find a TV technician in this hole, huh? Maybe it's just the settings? Please, go see for yourself. Strange, it worked fine in the morning. Maybe the snowfall caused it? Mom rubbed her hands clean on her apron and went to Olia's room. Oh, now's my chance to go out. I get it. I opened the front gate and went into the field, carefully so mom wouldn't see me from the window. When I crossed half of the distance toward the forest, the snow piles became as high as my knees. I remembered my nightly fears. I saw those silhouettes around here. They were jumping around, holding hands. That is so cool. 
They hip that hypnotizing music started playing in my head all on its own. In the light of day, those distant figures felt like a simple dream. The sun turned my nightmares to ash, but the aftertaste was still there. Distant ringing in my ears, distorted shadows crawling on the snow alongside me, and a barely audible whisper in my head, blurry and almost kind. Everything was silent. So silent I felt like the world was totally empty. No ground, no sky, no parents, no Olia. The time reached its limit, a one-way trip that ended at the forest's piney stockade. Sometimes silence was much scarier than any scream. Our parents would scream at each other while arguing and both me and Olia turned to stone, listening to them. But then always came the ringing silence. Out apartment, out, I think that's supposed to say our apartment, became numb a couple of days before we departed. It was hard to remember the last time mom and dad joked around, laughing, or spent time together, almost like all of it was in a previous life. When they kissed with Olia present, she always frowned and snorted in a funny way. But one day it all changed. Something important had left our home, and something scary filled the remaining void. It was as if a fire broke up, and our parents were hurriedly packing our belongings, trying to save themselves and us. From who, though? From the people with dead cold eyes who sometimes visited us in our previous home? The eyes that only saw balls of worms on the black ground and everything? And somewhere far away, a siren was going off, trying to warn us of the coming menace. I shuddered, chasing away my delusions, and looked around. There was only me, this white field, and the wind that was whipping up icy dust and belts of powdered snow. I squinted from the sun and turned my eyes to the sunless forest. It looked especially dark in contrast with the blinding whiteness. Knobby tree roots slithered under the snow like fat snakes. Rotten leaves and coniferous needles froze into the ice. Oh, that's a glove! That looks like a glove! Dry. Prickly branches intertwined, bringing up uncomfortable thoughts about fences. Were they protecting the forest? Or were they keeping something from breaking out? Some object was hanging from one of the pointy branches. I tried to get closer, drowning in snow, and when I almost got to the edge of the forest, I saw a knitted mitten. It looked like a wounded bird among the hungering semi-dark. Should I take it to the police? The senior officer looked gloomy but he still reminded me of Captain Casanova from my favorite TV show called The Streets of Broken Lights. He was always, he was also always anxious, with a tired look in his eyes, but still brave and strong. Will this mitten help them find the lost boy? Bova! I heard a distant shout, looked like it came from the river. Bova! As if the trees were calling out to someone. Bova! resonated closer to me. Someone was standing there behind the trees, hiding. Bova! I knew someone was looking for the lost boy, but still, something was unsettling about that figure. Its stillness, how it was bent unnaturally toward the ground. I don't see anything on screen yet. Its blackness. There's no one there, just branches and roots. It's all just my imagination. A nearby bird flapped its wings loudly. Whoa! A shadow split from the tree and disappeared from my sight. I looked away for just a moment, but when I turned my gaze back to the same place, it was gone. So it was my imagination after all. Silence reigned for a painfully long time. My muscles were tightly sprung. My heart was beating somewhere in my throat. Any noise, any little movement, any small whisper from the thicket, and I'd sprint. But nothing of the sort happened. I looked at the mitten once more. We're leaving. Lumps of snow fell from the branch that reminded me of the second soil, of the sound soil makes when you throw it into the pit on top of a casket. I immediately felt dizzy as if I was balancing at a precipice. I slowly backed away from my finding. 
It felt like the moment I touch it, a trap would spring and the mouse would get caught. Someone stepped on the ice behind me, close by. My inner voice whispered, save yourself, run. My nerves got the better of me. I ran, burying my head into my shoulders. Someone was chasing me from the darkness, breaking pine branches, closing the distance with giant leaps. Snow was slowing me down. Crazy thoughts flew through my mind. I'll get caught. They'll get me. I'll get dragged into the thicket. I'll be gone forever. But there was one more voice, probably one of reason. It gave me strength, spurred me on. You can do it. Don't stop. I heard an animal roar behind me. It was so loud, my ears went numb. It felt like the sound had come from a pack of hungry beasts rather than a single one. Their nostrils sucked in freezing air. They sensed my fear. Two giant wings flapped above my head. An enormous shadow flew over the clearing. A hoot, a wheeze. I continued to drown, sinking deeper and deeper with every desperate push. Was snow ever this sticky? I screamed in horror after realizing this wasn't snow. Someone or something in the snow pile was clutching my pants. I gathered all my strength and rushed forward. The pressure on my leg was gone. My boots slipped out of the hole and my soles were on a hard surface again. I reached a clear path with one jump and from there ran to my house. Its gloomy facade didn't look threatening now. That house was my light of defense from the shadows that flapped their wings and the creatures that were hidden under the snow. I tripped over the doorstep and smacked into the door. In all my hurry, I still managed to notice the claw marks, as if a dog was striking the wood with its paws, demanding to be let in so it could escape the cold. I hadn't noticed these marks when I was leaving. The heartbeat in my ears was much louder than my surroundings. I couldn't hear whether someone was following me or not. What if? They were already in our front yard, and Mom had locked the door, drowning in fear. I pulled on the doorknob, and it obediently gave way. I rolled into the hallway and shut the door behind me. Porch planks creaked as my pursuers ascended the stairs. My fingers slipped off the lock, and I couldn't click it into place. I gritted my teeth and pulled hard on the iron knob, whipping it between the boards. I stared blankly at the door. Someone was standing on the other side of the pitiful, flimsy barrier that was probably less useful than blankets. Wheezing breath reached into the house and crashed at me in waves. It smelled of pine and sweat. Mom peeked out of the kitchen and chastised me with the same frigid voice she always used when talking to Dad. What exactly didn't you understand when I told you to never slam the door? I, I didn't mean to. I snuck a glance at the door. The smell was gone, and the breath was too, if there was someone in the first place, of course. Here, mere five meters away from Mom, my fear was slowly weakening, melting like snow in spring, and with it the last bit of strength I had left in my body too. My legs gave way. I propped myself up against the wall so I wouldn't fall. Mom's expression had changed immediately. The cold mask of strictness and detachment was gone. Mom looked the same as before, all those quarrels. She finally saw my condition, my wet pants plastered with snow. Where have you been? What did I tell you, huh? I told you to stay home. Am I nothing to you too? I got afraid she would cry. I reached out to her like when I was very little and wanted her to cuddle me. But Mom regained her composure fast and put on her usual face. Her eyes shined like steel. Her voice rang out. Your dad can't find his cigarettes. Be honest. Did you snatch them? Were you smoking in secret? There was someone chasing me. I thought... I started as soon as I started explaining myself. Tears welled up in my eyes. Mom leaned towards me and sniffed my clothes like a beast, searching for the smell of tobacco. Then she squinted her eyes in suspicion and looked into the front yard. Her expression changed in an instant as she covered her mouth with her hand. Look, over there, at the fence. My heart started thumping as if I became prey once again and my pursuers were following me in the field. I could swear that I've heard something scratch at the door, just like in my nightmare. Mom beckoned me with her finger and I gathered all my remaining bravery to look into the kitchen window, facing my fear. I could barely discern some hairy silhouettes swimming in snow through the icy winter patterns on the glass. Dogs. Just a small pack of strays with no name and owner. 
barely reminding of the hungry monsters that live on the edge of the forest. Oh boy, were you scared of them? I think they'd rather be scared of you, Anton. They were chasing me, like a bunny. And what if they're rabid? The smile had slowly disappeared from Mom's face. Now she looked at the dogs as if it was her first time seeing them. What if they attack Olia? Mom, I wish your dad could just shoot them all. Mom, look, they're alive. Huh? What? Are they your friend or foe after all? Make up your mind. You're not a little kid anymore. Mom sighed in annoyance, and I felt so bitter that I bit my lower lip and fixed my gaze on the cobwebbed ridden corner. Well, some detective I am. In reality, I wasn't risking my life among monsters, but rather my pants among a pack of stupid strays. I wanted to sink through the floor from embarrassment. Come here, my boy who cried wolf. Oh, don't just stand there. Come, take your pills. A golden colored pill, reminiscent of a dead wasp, fell onto my palm. I already took one during breakfast. Don't talk over me. I told you to stay home, and you... Dad would have given you a good whipping for that. Come on, take it, or you won't be able to sleep at night, and you have school tomorrow. So I had to swallow the bitter medicine, drinking it down with similarly awful water that gave off a taste of chlorine. Maybe it wasn't Vova's mitten. Maybe it wasn't a mitten at all. Just like the forest monsters. And Olia's owl. Am I going mad? What's happening to me? Either the pill had an immediate effect, or my overexerted brain didn't let the fear inside anymore. Serenity washed over me, bringing yawny indifference along with it. Anton, you done? See, you can do it when you try. Take off your coat. Are you asleep? No, Mom, I was just thinking. What about, I wonder? It's just something silly. Mom scrutinized me with suspicious eyes, as if she wasn't sure she was looking at her own son and not some doppelganger that came from the forest. Is everything all right? You had the exact same expression when the policeman asked you about the window. I'm all right, Mom. She heaved a deep sigh. Fine. It seemed like the house had changed. The sofa's fabric had become discolored. Fingerprints appeared on the bathroom tiles. The light bulbs also felt different, dimmer and yellower. Even the saliva inside my mouth had a different taste. A melody from Aladdin could be heard from the upper floor. Olia was done re-watching her favorite Little Mermaid episodes and switched to other tapes. I slowly changed into my home clothes, stopped before the sink, and studied my reflection in the mirror like I was trying to solve one of those spot-the-difference puzzles. Then I went upstairs. Is that supposed to be Michael Jackson right there? That looks like Michael Jackson right there. Jafar's and Iago's voices died down. I walked past Olia's bedroom and slipped into my own. The simple action drained the last bit of strength from me. I sat on the bed. And only then I noticed there was someone behind the curtains. My tired hand dropped to the sheets. Whether it was due to the medication I took or the stress I underwent, the room began to contort, as if the wind was blowing the walls out like a pair of sails. The corners of the room bent and undulated. The only stable thing in the whole room was the figure between the windowsill and the curtains. A flimsy piece of cloth was stuck to my hidden visitor, just like a shroud. Olia? Who else would be standing there? I stood up and licked my dried up lips. Yeah, Olia, it's so funny. The silhouette was unmoving. It was enveloped softly by the curtains as if there was a thick layer of darkness there, not a human being. I reached toward the curtains. But um, but um, beat my heart, controlled by medication. The wind sang in the field with a chorus of voices. For a second, I wanted to return to the bed, just lie down and watch the person behind the curtains, knowing full well they were looking back at me. They're looking without blinking, waiting for me to fall asleep. Gotcha! I knew it was you from the beginning. A blindly bright halo lit up above Olia's head with the setting sun as the background. My sister was shining. When she was just a baby, Dad always used to say she was shining with happiness. I always retorted, but dad, she's not some flashlight. 
but I brought her to the window one day and sunlight poured on her smiling face. I felt like I was holding a light, woven child. Why did the police come? Did you do something? No, of course not. It's because of the owl, isn't it? I showed her a worried smile and rubbed her head. A boy got lost in the woods. Oh, he must be really cold out there. Will they find him? They will. The police are going house to house showing his photo to everybody. Olia traversed the room with care and pressed her tiny palms against the window. And why are they going to the houses and not the forest? Are they scared? The question caught me off guard. The police aren't scared of anything. They've already scouted the forest. I changed the topic, as if trying to get Olia as far away as possible from the forest thicket. We may get a reward if I go find this boy by myself. A lot of stuff, like in Field of Wonders. Sounds cool, right? Olia wasn't listening to me. She asked in a hushed voice while piercing the forest with incredibly adult eyes, uncharacteristic for her. What if the owl got him? Nonsense. An owl won't be able to lift a human. But you know what? I was picking my words with utmost care. I forced them out of my overexerted brain. Stay away from the forest. I think it's... How should I put it? It's cursed or something. Just like in a fairy tale? No, more like in that spooky tape our parents hide from us. Olia shivered and stole a glance at the window. As I looked at my sister, my heart was tearing apart. She was so fragile. It was so easy to stifle her light. A gust of wind and her small fire would be gone. You're lucky. Mom won't even let me go outside. I'm like a princess in the tower. Can't go anywhere. I'll die from boredom here. You're wrong. No one has ever died of boredom, and you have me and your cartoons, and mom and dad will be good to each other soon. You know what I wish would wish for my next birthday? I'd wished for mom and dad to turn into children so we could go and play together like we used to. Yeah, and if you'd make them as small as bugs, we could place them in our little box. Olia giggled and tugged at my sleeve. Tony, let's go watch Aladdin. Fatigue went over my desire to be with my little sister. I was washed over by some sort of heinous apathy. I'm too tired. I don't want to. Come on. It's so boring alone and mom is always busy. We can pick a cartoon you haven't seen before. I know all of our tapes by heart at this point. Not all of them. You haven't watched Peter Pan. Remember how you fell asleep in the middle of it? And so much happens after that. Let's go, let's go. Maybe a bit later. Should I tell you how it ends? Let's leave that for tomorrow. I won't tell you tomorrow. I know, let's play hide and seek. No, Olia. Then draw me a dino. Olia, please. Draw it, draw it. Will you leave me alone already? I blurted it out without thinking, and then I was immediately taken aback. I'd never screamed at my little sister like that. Olia stared at me in shock. Her lips started trembling, a precursor to tears. My chest was seething with disgust and embarrassment. What's happening to me? I hurried to prevent Olia from crying. All right, you win. Let's go watch cartoons for a bit. I don't wanna. I came up to her, put my hand on her soft head. Let's go. Let's go watch Peter Pan. Boo, you'll fall asleep again. I smiled and lifted her chin. Her eyes were wet and felt bottomless. I promise I won't. And I'll draw you a full Triceratops later. Hooray! tri pops Well, close enough. Olia rubbed her eyes with a sleeve of her pajamas, and a shining smile returned to her face. I'll go ask Mom for condensed milk and bread, and you rewind the tape. The bread is fresh, just how you like it. All right, just be careful not to spill the milk, or you'll be yelled at again. Want to bet I won't spill it? The tape is somewhere in the nightstand. Look for it. Olia disappeared into the doorway, and I dragged my feet into the neighboring room. The old photon TV was gathering dust in the corner. All that was left was clicking the button on the front panel. The tube warmed up and familiar white noise started dancing on the black screen. I almost reached out to turn on the VCR when the noise calmed down and a blurry image appeared for a 
moment. It was a dark, taiga forest, just like the one outside my window. The picture split the screen in half. Something creepy resembling human speech was coming out of the speaker. Just a few moments, moments later, the scenery was again overshadowed by noise. Did I catch some rogue signal? Local TV station only really showed Soviet cartoons, and even that was pretty rare. And only just recently, I used to watch Ro Robotech before school. It was so awesome. Maybe I should tinker with the antenna. What if I catch this channel again? On the other hand, Olia had asked me to find the tape. It wouldn't be nice to disappoint her, but in my sleepy state, I didn't have the strength to do all of it. I sifted through the shelves of dolls and blue hippos from Kinder Surprise. I found the tape I needed thanks to its shabby spine. I got the black rectangle from its box. Achievement unlocked, Neverland. The tape inside it rustled while rewinding to the beginning. This rustling was lulling me to sleep. Drowsiness attacked me while I was squatting before the TV. Images whirled into my head, me and Olia flying above the forest, tumbling in the soft clouds. My little sister is laughing, but her smile becomes more and more forced with every passing second. I notice that the clouds underneath us part, bearing the bristly pine tops. Swampy darkness slurped among the trees. The wings are no longer able to hold us and Olia. You haven't started without me, have you? My sister brought the tray with unevenly cut bread and a whole can of condensed milk. I rubbed my eyes. No, come sit. Mom and dad are arguing again. They're going through rough times. Rough times are lame, ain't that the truth? On the screen, Wendy was hiding Peter Pan's shadow into the dresser. Olia was entertained by the cartoonish dog, Nana. Maybe mom and dad will buy us a dog too? Yeah, right. I'll have my own dog in the Neverland, and a cat, and a parrot. Olia smeared a slice of bread with a thick layer of condensed milk and handed it to me. Have you lost all of your baby teeth? Obviously, Olia frowned, deep in thought. Peter Pan has baby teeth. What if they won't let you go to his land with adult teeth? We'll think of something. We'll ask dad to alter your age in the passport. And why would dad forge documents? Olia took a bite from the sandwich and started talking with her mouth full. He were, he would mom they did that before. You'll grow ears as big as Dumbo's. Olia got worried and touched her ear. I smiled to myself. My little sister was silent now. She just devoured bread, watching the adventures of Peter Pan, Tinkerbell, and James Hook, as if she got sucked into the fairy tale Neverland. To be honest, I also imagined myself there, in a land where no one ever ages, where no one argues over little things, where no one listens to fights and the sound of broken plates at night. It felt like I was dreaming with my eyes still open. Then my sister's scream pulled me back to reality. Tony, shut the curtains fast. Why? No one's watching you. It's dark, and when it's dark, the owl comes. I'm scared. I got out of bed, fighting my drowsiness, and closed the curtains. I did my best not to look outside, toward the treetops, toward the taiga forest, which seemingly drew closer and closer. Of course, it was just a visual effect from shadows of branches scraping the snow. Tony, Mom thinks I made the owl up, and Dad, too, thinks I'm a liar since I'm small. But the owl exists. Honestly, honestly it does. You do believe me, right? That it comes every night, and, and... I swiftly grabbed Olia's hand and looked her in the eyes. I was trying to transfer at least some of my courage and determination. But did I really have those qualities? Yes, I believe you, all right? Just don't nag our parents about it anymore. They're already dealing with a lot, so they'll just get mad at you. Come and tell me if anything happens, and don't look out the window. But it wants me to look. Doesn't matter. 
Act like it doesn't exist and never existed, like it's made up, just like mom and dad say, it'll get tired of waiting and fly away. We followed Peter Pan's adventures as if nothing had happened, as if the forest didn't kidnap kids, as if our parents weren't tearing each other apart bit by bit. Captain Hook was running away from a crocodile, and Captain Pan was headed to London on a gilded sailboat. By some miracle, I lasted longer than my little sister. Olia's eyelids had drooped, or dropped. She started snorting lightly. Olia's eyelids had dropped. She started snorting lightly, resting her chin on the side of the bed. I stood up and left Olia's room. I was looking out the window, studying the field, when Mom peeked into my room. Enough playing around. It's your first day at school tomorrow. Go to bed. You should sleep properly. You don't want to be teased for being sleepy, right? Adults think everything is so simple, as if sound sleep would ensure my classmates would like me. I covered myself with a blanket up to my neck and listened to the house humming, to something invisible rustling in the corners. My inner voice had a question for me. Do I want to hear that mysterious flute again? Yes or no? Maybe it's just a part of growing up, and I can't fully understand my own desires. The forest wailed behind the barrier that was my walls. Some ethereal entity wandered the fields. Branches shook as if calling for me. The wind howled on and on in the night. My thoughts were like annoying fleas that entered my head before becoming weak and tangled. I didn't notice how I fell into slumber. Oh, thank you for completing episode one of Tiny Bunny. Did you enjoy it? Do you want to know what happens next? We're already working hard on the continuation of the story. Nice! Oh, that was so nice! That was so nice. It was literally just me reading a story to y'all, but that was nice. I liked it. I definitely can't wait for the next part. Oh, that was so worth it. It was so well drawn out too. The art is amazing. The story, the it wasn't all that scary. It had, you know, a couple of good spooks, like good, real good spooks. That one where the wolf jumps at me in the room. That by far, it didn't fully jump scare me like it could have, but everything on the inside. Yeah. But I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you guys enjoyed this story time. If you did, why not leave the video a like? Let me know what you think down in the comments below. And if you haven't already, why not consider subscribing? Hit that notification bell for more of this mayhem. Until next time, I appreciate all of you for watching. I can subscribe for more, for I will continue to make these videos for many moons. Stay safe out there, and never forget to holla at your bear. Peace out.